Welcome back to Harbour Unbox. Today we are checking out Intel's Core i9-10900K for the first time. Not to be confused with their Core i9-10900X, which is a rather pointless 10-core Cascade Lake X part available in the LGA 2066 socket. The 10900K should be a much more interesting product, coming in $100 cheaper, and it's available on some pretty good looking Z490 motherboards that use the LGA 1200 socket. But before we get too far into this video, Today's video is sponsored by Western Digital and their WD Blue SN550 SSD. This next generation NVMe SSD provides optimal performance for content creators and PC enthusiasts, with over four times the speed of SATA SSDs. With the SN550, you'll be hitting breakneck read speeds up to 2400 megabytes per second, with sustained high performance made possible thanks to an improved thermal design. The SN550 is available up to one terabyte in size at affordable prices, making it a great value choice for your next PC build. I highly recommend you check it out via the links below. Okay, so for those of you not up to speed yet, the Core i9-10900K is a 10-core, 20-thread processor sporting a base frequency of 3.7 GHz, and a single-core turbo of 5.3 GHz using Intel's new thermal velocity boost. Now, when compared to the 9900K, the L3 cache size has increased from 16 megabytes to 20 megabytes, and the TDP has increased from 95 watts to 125 watts. But like the 9900K, the 10900K has the same $488 US MSRP, though there are a few issues with this, and I'll address those towards the end of the video. For now, I'm sure you'd rather we get to the benchmarks as quickly as possible. So for testing the Ryzen processors, we used the Gigabyte X570 Aorus Master, while the 8th and 9th gen Intel Core processors were tested on the Gigabyte Z390 Aorus Ultra, and the new 10th gen Intel Core processors on the ASUS ROG Maximus 12 Extreme. Finally, all configurations were tested using a GeForce RTX 2080 Ti, 32 gigabytes of DDR4-3200CL14 memory, and a Corsair Hydro Series H150i Pro 360mm all-in-one liquid cooler. Just finally, I tested the 10900K in two configurations. One is a stock configuration with XMP loaded, which sees the multi-core enhancement setting disabled by default, as it should be. And then the second configuration, which has been labeled MCE, features multi-core enhancement enabled. So just to be clear, all my testing was conducted with the ASUS ROG Maximus 12 Extreme, and with MCE enabled, the board maintained an all-core clock frequency of 4.9 gigahertz. But with MCE disabled, which is the default configuration for this motherboard, the frequency dropped as low as 4.3 gigahertz. That is the all core clock frequency. Now, Intel advertises up to 4.9 gigahertz all core turbo, depending on the workload and duration. So it seems ASUS are adhering to the base spec. However, after I'd finished all my testing, I started messing around with the other motherboards from the other brands, and I found quite different boost behavior. Using the MSI Z490 Tomahawk, for example, the board by default runs all cores at 4.9 gigahertz, regardless of the workload or duration. And then with MSI's own version of MC enabled, which they call Enhanced Turbo, the 10900K's all core frequency was 5.1 gigahertz. And again, that was 5.1 gigahertz during any workload for any duration. Basically, MSI is allowing the Tomahawk to run in the maximum power state indefinitely, whereas ASUS follows the Intel spec and after a short period of time does reduce the clock speeds. That all means that the MC results shown in this video are probably going to be very similar to what you'll see out of the box with the Tomahawk. Anyway, I just wanted to point that out as you're likely going to see some variance in the results from one review to the next. And please note, this is not something any of the reviewers are doing to make Intel look better or worse, but rather it's a result of each board maker interpreting the Intel spec in their own way. I've also gone with the ASUS board for my testing as it was provided by Intel and they claim it's working as intended. Also, I did try one of the MSI boards, the Unify first, and I couldn't get that board to boot. There was some BIOS issues. We tried to work through them in the end. We couldn't get it to work. I don't know if there's something wrong with that board or not. I wasted quite a lot of time on that one. Then I jumped over to the Gigabyte Aorus Extreme, and the latest BIOS version that Gigabyte had available at the time didn't see the processor boosting correctly. There was all kinds of problems with the results, so I had to skip that board. And in the end, I just went with the board that Intel provided, which was the ASUS one. So anyway, now that we've got all out of the way, let's just get into the results and we'll see what's what. First up, we have Cinebench R20, and I think the results seen here are going to be rather telling. In its default configuration, the 10900K scored 6,101 points, and that made it 25% faster than 3700X and 9900K. Meanwhile, enabling MCE boosted performance by a further 5%, which is 
pretty typical for that setting. But when compared to the 3900X, the 10900K was 19% slower. So that means it's positioned between the 8 and 12 core Ryzen processors. And while that's hardly shocking news, it is a pretty rough place for Intel's new 10 core part to end up, given the 3900X can be regularly found on sale for a little over $400 US, making it cheaper and faster. But before we draw any serious conclusions, let's move on to check out a lot more data. Where the 10900K is very strong is single core performance, thanks to that 5.3 GHz clock frequency. This allowed it to score a very impressive 551 points, making it 3% faster than the 3950X and 6% faster than the 3900X. It's also an 8% improvement over the 9900K, which tops out at 5 GHz. Moving on to the 7-zip compression test, and here we see the 10900K once again finds itself positioned between the 3700X and 3900X, though it's closer to the 8-core part in terms of performance. Here it was just 16% faster than the 3700X, making it 17% slower than the 3900X. And the margins are similar when looking at decompression performance. Here the 10900K was 12% faster than 3700X, but 25% slower than the 3900X. So again, not a great place for Intel's flagship desktop offering to be at. Here we see that the Ryzen processors still largely dominate AES encryption performance, and the Sysoft Sandra benchmark is one of the more balanced tests. Despite that though, the 3900X was 55% faster than the 10900K. Here we see that the 10900K is just 16% faster than the 9900K in the Blender Open Data benchmark, and that made it 20% slower than the 3900X. However, enabling MCE does boost performance quite substantially in this test, as the all-core clock speed increases from 4.3 GHz to 4.9 GHz, though as you'll see later in this video, that has quite the impact on power consumption. The 10900K provides a 27% performance boost over the 9900K in the V-Ray benchmark, and while that meant it was 30% faster than the 3700X, it was still 13% slower than the 3900X. We see that enabling MCE does boost performance by a further 7%, but you can also boost the 3900X by a single digit figure as well, by using PBO. Here we see that the 10900K does quite well in the Corona benchmark, and with MCE enabled it was able to match the 3900X, so there is that. Stock, however, it was 10% slower. Here's a look at code compilation performance, and here the 10900K again finds itself positioned between the 3900X and 3700X. Basically, it was 18% faster than 3700X, but still 20% slower than the 3900X, and that does really seem to be the 10900K in a nutshell when it comes to productivity performance. Moving on to video editing performance with DaVinci Resolve Studio 16, and here we see that the 10900K is barely able to outperform the Ryzen 7 3700X, boosting performance by a mere 1.5%. And that meant the 3900X was 9% faster. Not a huge margin by any means, but the slightly more affordable Ryzen processor was faster in this test. Here we see that the 10900K is more competitive in Premiere Pro, as it outscored the 3700X by a 14% margin, making it just 5% slower than the 3900X. So a decent result and certainly a big performance uplift from the 9900K. Photoshop benefits from strong single core performance and as a result the 10900K performed very well here, beating even the 3950X by a 7% margin. So if you're after every last bit of performance in Photoshop, then the 10900K is the way to go. Here we see that the new 10-core Core i9 processor was also strong in After Effects, though here it basically matched the 3900X, so while not an outright win, at least it was just as fast. Now here's a look at the total system power consumption numbers, and as you can see when adhering to the 125 watt TDP spec, the 10900K sips power, as total system usage is just below that of the Ryzen 7 2700X. So that's a pretty good result really. I should note though that this is the sustained power usage once the processor backs all the cores down to 4.3 GHz. Prior to that, power consumption looks very much like what we see with MC enabled. Speaking of which, with MC enabled, which I do believe is the stock configuration for most other Z490 motherboards, such as the MSI Tomahawk for example, well, power consumption skyrockets and now we're looking at just over 300 watts for the total system. Okay, so time for some gaming benchmarks, and first up we have Battlefield 5, tested at 1080p using the ultra quality preset with a GeForce RTX 2080 Ti graphics card. Here the 10900K basically matched the 1900K, and that meant it was 8% faster than the 3900X, pushing the average frame rate from 156 FPS to 168 FPS. As expected, that margin does shrink as we move to the more GPU-bound 1440p resolution, and now the 10900K was just 5% faster than the 3900X. 
Far Cry New Dawn highlights a worst case scenario for Ryzen, and here the 10900K is 18% faster than the 3900X, which is quite a significant margin, and 134 FPS on average opposed to 114 FPS will be more desirable for high refresh rate gamers. That margin remains pretty much the same at 1440p, as even here we're still mostly CPU bound, and as a result the 10900K was still 16% faster than the 3900X. We see fairly typical margins in the new Gears Tactics game, here the 10900K was 8% faster than 3900X when comparing the average frame rate, and 11% faster when comparing the 1% low results. The margins do close up quite a bit at 1440p, and here the 10900K was 6% faster than the 3900X when comparing the average frame rate, but interestingly, we see no difference for the 1% low result, leading to a very similar gaming experience. Moving on to Rainbow Six Siege, and here we were looking at a 3% boost in performance for the 10900K over the 9900K, with a 5% improvement in 1% low performance. So, not exactly mind-blowing stuff, but as promised by Intel, the 10900K is now the world's fastest gaming processor. It was also just 6% faster than the 3900X, but with both pushing well over 200 FPS at all times, I'm really not sure how much that margin matters. Once again, 1440p helps bring everything together, and now the 10900K is just 3% faster than the 3900X, or 2% when comparing the 1% low results. Ghost Recon Breakpoint isn't a particularly CPU demanding title, and here the 10900K was just 5% faster than the 3900X, and I'd say this is a fairly accurate representation of modern gaming performance. The margin actually opens up a little bit at 1440p, and now the 10900K is 7% faster than the 3900X. Not exactly anything to get too excited about, but you can enjoy a few extra frames. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is a very CPU demanding title, particularly the open world section we use for testing. And on that note, just to be clear, these results haven't been recorded using the built-in benchmark, which we feel isn't very CPU demanding and not a good way to test CPU performance in this title. Instead, we're using OCAT to measure in-game performance. And here we see very strong results from the 10900K when looking at the 1% low data. Here it was 22% faster than the 9900K and 14% faster than the 9700K, which does appear to fare a little bit better with hyperthreading disabled, though that's not terribly unusual, we do see that sort of thing quite often. Moving to 1440p sees the higher end CPUs hit a GPU bottleneck, and as a result the 3900X, 3950X and 10900K all deliver the same 99fps average and 91fps 1% 1 low. Finally, we have Red Dead Redemption 2 with dialed down quality settings, and despite that, we're still running into a fairly strong GPU bottleneck with these higher end CPUs, limiting performance to just over 100 FPS on average. And the same thing can be seen at 1440p, though the slightly higher single core performance of the 10900K appears to give it a small advantage, though we're talking just a 2% boost over the 9900K. Finally, here's a look at the seven game average results, and given what we just saw, it won't surprise you to learn that on average, the 10900K is 7% faster than the 3900X. That's really not a big margin at 1080p using an RTX 2080 Ti, but it does mean Intel retains the performance crown when it comes to gaming. Again, no shockers there. Last up, here's a look at operating temperatures during our Blender stress test, again with the Corsair Hydro Series H150i Pro installed. Stock the 10900K peaked at 63 degrees, which I have to admit is lower than I was expecting, but then power usage is reasonably good, all things considered, with a package power of 125 watts. It seems voltage optimization and a stringent binning process is to thank for this, as all 10 cores clocked at 4.3 GHz required just 1.03 volts. However, if you enable MCE, that does push the operating temperature up to 84 degrees, which again is lower than what I was expecting given the package power hit 200 watts, and here the CPU was fed 1.172 volts. Okay, so we've had a pretty good look at how the Core i9-10900K performs in applications and games, and of course how it stacks up against AMD's competing Ryzen processors. The question now is, should you buy it? So let's start by addressing that question based purely on the performance just seen. When it comes to games, the new 10-core Intel processor was up to 18% faster than the 3900X, which is a reasonably large margin, but on average it was just 7% faster, and frankly you'd be hard-pressed to tell the difference. In fact, for the vast majority of games, it'll simply be impossible. Not to mention that the 7% average that we saw, that was seen at 1080p with an RTX 2080 Ti. So if we were to compare those results at 1440p, the 10900K is now just 5% faster than the 3900X when comparing the average frame rate as well as the 1% low data. 
Then when it comes to applications, we found that the 10900K was up to 35% slower than the 3900X, and there were a number of instances where it was slower by a 15% marginal greater. Moreover, in the rare instance where the Core i9 processor was actually faster, we were looking at single digit gains. For example, you're almost certainly not gonna notice a 9% performance boost in Photoshop, but you'll surely notice a 15% or greater reduction in compression, code compilation, or rendering slash encoding performance. There's also the little matter of performance per watt, and due to unfortunate circumstances that have seen Intel stuck on the 14 nanometer process for significantly longer than intended, the 10900K is, it's pretty power hungry, at least it's very power hungry relative to seven nanometer Ryzen parts such as the 3950X. For the most part, I don't see this as being too much of an issue though. Using a decent cooler will keep the 10 core Comet Lake CPU cool enough and it is a $500 US processor, so there's a good chance you're gonna be installing something on it like what we did, 360 millimeter all-in-one liquid cooler or a very large air-cooled tower cooler. But it does use more power, and in applications like Blender, for example, it does so while delivering significantly less performance. So I feel in terms of performance, the Core i9-10900K is a bit of a tough sell, and it is certainly a very niche product. In fact, I'm not entirely sure who this part is for. Perhaps it's for someone who wants the ultimate gaming performance and better video rendering maybe than what you could get with say the 10700K that we'll be looking at tomorrow. But for whatever reason, you don't wanna sacrifice some gaming performance in favor of even better video rendering performance at a lower price with something like the 3900X. With the Ryzen 9 3900X down around $410 US, a price that it has been available at since March this year, the 10900K is fetching a serious price premium at $530 US, the current pre-order price over at Newegg.com. Meanwhile, over at our favorite Australian retailer, PC Case Gear, the 10900K is available for pre-order at $1,000 AUD, almost 30% more than the $780 they're charging for the 3900X. That's a massive price premium and the Intel processor simply isn't worth it. If the 10900K was coming in at $410 US, I could certainly make an argument for purchasing it over AMD's 3900X, especially if you're just gaming, but it's such a large price premium, as I said, it's simply not worth it. However, the biggest problem with the Core i9 10900K might not even be the performance or the price, but rather availability. There's been plenty of speculation over the past month or so that the 10th gen core series releases nothing more than a paper launch, and I have it on pretty good authority that this is indeed the case. Despite opening up for pre-orders weeks ago, retailers have very little stock, and while the demand hasn't been crazy, at least that's what I've been told, it has heavily outstripped supply, leaving retailers with orders they simply can't fill and probably won't be able to anytime soon, and that's no doubt gonna lead to unhappy customers. In short, the chances of getting a Core i9-10900K in hand seem extremely remote at this point. Of course, some people will be able to get them, but I think a lot of you will miss out who are interested. And from what I can gather, Intel isn't promising retailers any kind of supply at this point. So while I don't think we'll end up with another 10980XE situation where the CPU kind of just doesn't exist at all, supply is going to be so limited that we'll see price scalping and that'll result in buyers probably turning to something like Ryzen instead, where you can get a processor very easily at a reasonable price. On another note, it's pretty crazy to think it's been six months since the release of the Ryzen 9 3950X, and Intel still has no answer, leaving AMD to command the highest price on the desktop. To think just two years ago, Intel was charging $1,000 for their fully fledged 10 core desktop part, the Core i9 9900X. Today, you're getting a slightly faster chip for half that. More evidence that competition in this market segment is very much a good thing if for some reason you required evidence. As for motherboard prices, it looks like there are some decent Z490 options for under $200 US, so that seems reasonable, and at the very least is comparable to AMD's X570 lineup. Also, depending on demand from you guys, the viewers, we could start testing VRM thermal performance for some of the more affordable boards and go from there. So let me know in the comment section below if you wanna see some Z490 testing. Tomorrow, I'll be looking at the Core i7 10700K, and that'll be followed by the Core i5 10600K, probably on the weekend. We'll have Tim's News Corner between those two reviews. And then I'm hoping next week I'll be able to purchase uh, the Core i3 models, but no word on availability there. So not sure if we'll be able to provide a review next week or not. But yeah, we'll have to wait and find out. But anyway, that is going to do it for my first look at the 10900K. 
Uh, let me know what you guys think about this new part in the comment section below and if there's anything else you'd like us to look at. But that, yeah, really is going to do it for this one. If you liked the video, you guys know what to do. We also have our Patreon account if you want to get access to our exclusive Discord chat. Really cool community over there. Tim and myself chat with you guys quite a bit. We have our monthly live stream, which will be coming up next week. Q&As, behind the scenes videos and all that kind of stuff. So check it out if you are interested. But anyway, above all else, thank you for watching. I'm your host, Steve, and I'll see you again next time.